This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Bean, and here with me is Chris Kent. Hello, Mr. Kent. Hello, sir. Also here with us is Annie Margarita Yang, best-selling author, financial expert, and lifeline to, mill uh, to millennials navigating a complex financial landscape. Annie, thank you for joining us uh, here today. Thanks for having me on the Prestigious Initiative. Very good. Annie, your journey from minimum wage jobs to becoming an accounting manager and best-selling author is, is, is inspiring. Can you share with our listeners how your unique experiences help to shape your, your approach to financial uh, and, and, and career success? Yeah, this my unique experience is just, I think it's actually the common millennial experience of like, we work minimum wage jobs and then we think that we cannot get ahead. So what happened to me was after high school, I worked a whole string of minimum wage jobs. And my guidance counselor always told me that I will be a failure in life if I didn't go straight to college. So I kind of like, I was like, oh, if I can't make more than what a McDonald's worker makes, right? If I can't play a good offense in terms of making money, maybe I can get really good at saving money. So that's where I diverged from that millennial experience because then I was like, okay, I'm going to go gung-ho in learning how to save money. I read every article I could um, every day. Literally, the thing, first thing I would do when I would wake up is I would search how to save money and then I would actually implement them to see if they worked and things like that. Uh, so I saved 25% of my income from my, my first job at a bare minimum, that's how much I saved. Um, and then I was able to even move out of my parents' house on full-time minimum wage as well. And then I did eventually go to college, but coming out, I was working at Domino's Pizza, again, for minimum wage. So it wasn't that like golden ticket, everyone was pressuring me all the time to believe like, oh, if you just go to college, you'll be successful, you have a better job. And it wasn't the case. I had to actually like fight. I, I had to like really put in a lot of work to make sure I was seen, to get the opportunities I wanted because I knew I was capable, but then it felt like nobody wanted to give me just a chance to prove myself. So when I moved to Boston from Texas after working at Domino's, I was just like, I don't care what people say, no accounting degree, I don't care. You know, I'm so good at managing the little money that I have. If I'm so good at making this dollar stretch, why can't I do it for a business? If I can make, if I can manage a cash flow like this and watch every penny, I I don't even let like the store rip me off on sales tax. You know, <laughs> like I I think a business would really appreciate this kind of personality and and attitude uh, toward their money. So I started applying to accounting jobs and I got one in only seven days. And then in my second job search, a couple months later, I got it in six days. Then in my third one, I got it in only five days. So I think the way I diverged is because like, I don't want to let those stereotypes dictate my financial future. Okay. So that, that's kind of interesting. So you, you took a different path than what most people did. And I'm curious because you talked about saving did that, I mean, it would have to include uh, being frugal with your money, being being selective on the things you buy. Um, did you did you kind of diverge into like minimalism as far as like not buying anything or like uh, tell me a little bit about how that how that process went for you? Oh, yeah, that's that's interesting. You're the first one to have asked me about minimalism. So I did discover minimalism when I was 16. So I actually discovered minimalism before I discovered frugality because I was in high school and I was reading Zen Habits and the minimalist.com. And I was like, oh, my gosh, these are people who earned six figures. They had the life. They had everything. And then they they were like, why am I so empty? Why do I feel inside like so empty and they decided to like pay off their debts quickly sell everything off and then like travel in the world or or do something crazy with just a backpack these kind of guys right and then i was like wow this is so different it's so unconventional and i want to try something like that because you know i've been in like k to 12 my whole life and that's that's when i it's because of reading about minimalism that I questioned. I was like, is it really the right path to go straight to college and to take on all these student loan debts like that teachers and guidance counselors and and my classmates as well were telling me like, oh, yeah, you'll make a lot more money if you if you just follow that path. And I'm just like, really? And even if I do, will I be happy? You know, I, I, I wasn't sure because these guys, these influencers 
bloggers were huge influencers back then in 2012 <laughs> <laughs> were saying otherwise and and um i wanted to listen to that instead right we all have a choice in what we choose to listen to um so i followed that and um yeah so for a very long time i was very minimalist i have so much stuff today <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah a lot for a very long time the only stuff i owned all could fit into a suitcase <laughs> And so I, I'm sure, especially early on, you know, in, in the college years and even a little bit afterwards, that's got to be really tough to try to be on that kind of minimalism path while everybody else is on a, on, on a materialistic path. Um, so congratulations on, on, on doing that and making that work for, your, for yourself. Now, Thank you. your book, your, your five day uh, job search has been a valuable research for, for young professionals. What inspired you to write this book and, and, how does it empower individuals in their job search journey? What inspired me is like, I am so sick and tired of people like my guidance counselor from 10 years ago. They're still spouting the same nonsense that if you like this kind of thing, like when I was in school, all right, she asked me, what do you want to do with your life? My answer was, I don't know what I want to do. Right. And then she was like, well, at least what do you like? And then I said, well, at this time in my life, as I'm exploring my interests outside of school, I might like jewelry making, I might like holistic health. I'm really into yoga. I was practicing yoga every day. And then she was just like, well, why don't you get a college degree in yoga? I found this school for you that has a major in yoga and it will only cost you $40,000 in student loan debt. And then I was like, what? And I still I still remember those words, you know, and she was telling me about how I can never be successful. I'm doomed for failure. And then I was just like, nobody is nobody doing anything about this. You know, like I thought I thought there was really smart people in this world. Back when it, it was like 2012, 2013, the average college graduate came out owing twenty six thousand. Right. And it was already a, like considered a big problem back then. And then now we're in 2023 and I'm just like, surely someone has done something about this problem, right? And then so I revisit this problem. I'm looking at re news articles about this subject and now people are coming out with $36,000 in student loan debt. And I'm just like, not only, it hasn't even gotten better, it's just straight up gotten worse. And that's with like internet, right? We have, we're able to take, to get an education online, right? So it's not about like, going into brick and mortar, you have to pay all this rent, you can literally get educated online affordably, comparatively to university. And I'm just like, nobody has solved this problem, huh? Nobody. <laughs> so so a, a huge part of my book, The Five Day Job Search is really, it's this whole paradigm shift that I think people need to take because the solutions are there, right? The, people are already working on the solutions. It's just that young people who are not 18 yet, they're not taking them. So with with that your your book seemingly your, your your target audience for your book is is 18 ish somebody that's that's getting ready to move into the job market is that is that correct there's two target markets there's that you know it's because i want to convince people who aren't 18 yet please if it doesn't fit into your overall like 50 year plan for your career like what do you want to do do you want to be a pilot you need a pilot's license you know you don't need a, a bachelor's degree right uh, why don't you go straight for, for you know, the pilot, right? It, it doesn't make sense to do this, do it in a roundabout way. So that's one of the target markets. But the other target market is the millennial who's complaining that they cannot get ahead, you know, because they owe all these student loan debts um, on average, right? Like the average person who owes student loan debt, they take 21 years to pay it off. And then the overall effect of it is that they delay home ownership, they delay getting married because they don't want to like get married and then merge their finances with their future spouse. And then like, well, then now that debt is considered each other's and stuff like that. And then they also delay having kids. And then even when they do have kids, just as they've finished paying off their student loan debt, they already have to start saving for college for their kids. Right. So it's like this huge problem. And um, I, I wrote this book because I made a huge pay pay raise in my second accounting job to my third one, right? I was making 45K. So that's an entry level accounting job, all right? 45K is entry level. I think with inflation is probably 50K, maybe 55K at this point in Boston. Um, and the recruiter 
was telling me, oh, you'll never, um, what was he saying? I had this recruiter in my, my third job search. He was telling me that I'll never be capable of making more than 55K. If I'm lucky, I can make 60K. But, you know, I've been recruiting for 10 years and in the accounting field and like, they will never hire someone like you without that formal accounting credential. And then like, you know, I think if he said that to someone else, they would have just given up and they would have been like, oh, OK, I got to go back to school um, for at least two years. You know, like, let's say you got a bachelor's degree, right? You, you just need to take another two years worth for those major requirements to get your um, a, a second bachelor's degree in accounting. Right. And it's like, oh, now, I'll, OK, I got to pay all this money for this additional schooling just so i can work in accounting right and then but like my response was kind of just like who are you to tell me how much i can make right like i kind of just said to him i was like you know there are far more important things to employers such as like work ethic attitude discipline um be having to be told how to do something only once right setting expectations only once and then meeting those expectations, following instructions, you know, being organized, well spoken. I think those are like far more important attributes to employer because like I can learn anything on the job. You know, if an employer had a training manual, they can teach me. Right. Um, but he didn't believe that. So two days later, I got an offer for 80K. So that's a 35K increase from this, the other job that I was working. And and I said, look at this can't make more than that. Now I make 150 K. Right. But that that's a jump. And he was telling me I can't do it. So I want this book for millennials, because if there people have on average, like 35 K in student loan debt with that kind of pay increase, I mean, I can, you can easily pay it off in a year. Right. If you kept yeah. the same lifestyle instead of having lifestyle inflation after getting a better paying job, then you can take that difference and pay off your student loan debt in a year, two years time, then you can move on with your life instead of asking the government to forgive your student loan debt. And, and you know, you're, you're so right, because those those attributes that you talked about, the job uh, that, that the, the bosses are looking for, those are exactly what the bosses are looking for. And on top of that, that's not the things that you're learning in school. You're not learning the communication skills. You're not learning how to do things, you know, when you're you're asked to do them or learn on the job how to do whatever it is. I, I think that you know, if if school, maybe maybe you know, high school, primary school, into into the university age, if they were teaching those type of things, then the the society would be much better off. We would be, like you said, that we wouldn't have the, the debt that we have because it wouldn't cost as much to do those things. Especially if we could do that at a young age, moving through to teach people how to be people, how to be adults as they move into adulthood, and then on top of that, most jobs. Okay, maybe there's a few jobs that you actually a doctor, so you need to have some prior, you know, training for that. Uh, I understand, but most jobs you can learn on the job, and I would, I would say, I would argue that most jobs, after you finish university, you're gonna not use most eighty, ninety percent of that stuff that you learned because it's not viable, it's not useful either, it's outdated, or it's just completely off base and doesn't matter to what your job actually is in the day to day. So going to a job learning on the job from either uh, you know a manual that they have or as you go through the process of doing it is far better than going to university and, and, and spending huge amounts of money and being in debt. And then hopefully you can get a job in that area that you specialized in or going to, to, to do that job. And they're realizing that all of that information was basically useless because I don't use any of it in my day-to-day -day job. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let me tag on to what you're saying. I mean, outdated information right like let's say mm. you got a college degree in marketing today are they teaching you how to market on TikTok? no, no? <laughs> you know like TikTok <laughs> came out in 2019 i i think the textbooks still haven't caught up and the professors <laughs> who are not on TikTok haven't caught up they don't know how to use the platform <laughs> They mm -hmm. don't know how to grow on the platform. You know, I think actually the best person to teach about how to market on TikTok is a TikTok influencer right right Yes. You have to be careful what kind of sources you use when you learn something. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, okay, so speaking about your videos, you, you have your videos, your books, you you emphasize the importance of financial empowerment uh, for millennials and, and Gen Z. What are some act actionable steps that young adults can take to help to manage their finances uh, more efficiently and kind of escape the the, the trap that everybody's trying to put them in, the, the stu those uh, student loans? 
Yeah, the first thing I always tell people, this is in the book, this is in the introduction, it's about finding your calling. If you don't know what your calling is, which is, I think that's, that's your job. You know, Oprah Winfrey has said, after you get a job that pays your bills, your next job is to figure out what your calling is, right? We don't always know what it is. It's your job to reflect, to dig deep and find, like, find out inside, peel back those layers of the onion to discover it. And then after you know what your calling is, it is to go after that calling to have the courage to actually pursue it, even though other people say it's unreasonable or it's impossible. So I think the first thing is get a job, any job that will pay your bills. That's my advice for a young person. Ideally, if it's something that's interesting to you, that's great. But I think like people think, I don't know why, they think a minimum wage job now needs to pay $20 and no, not 20. The exact number is $19 and 97 cents in Seattle starting January 1st, 2024. Um, uh, yeah. Those kind of jobs were never meant to be able to afford you a one bedroom apartment near where you live. Like they were never meant to be that. They were never meant to be a career. They were meant to be for someone who has absolutely no experience and we're just starting out in the workforce. And then you were supposed to not stay there, but look for something better, you know, and say, now I have experience and, and I can get a better paying job. But I don't know why. Yeah, that, that, that's a whole societal issue. But like, there's so much you can learn at a minimum wage job. I think people look down on it. Right? Like, for example, um, at one of the, my first my first minimum wage job, ShopRite grocery store in Brooklyn, New York, right? I was a cashier. And I, I thought I was terrible at it because I couldn't tell the difference between a zucchini and a cucumber every time they tested me or like cilantro versus parsley. I couldn't tell. They're testing me on like the four digit code, the PLU code of all these fruits and vegetables. I didn't have them memorized. They were complaining that my my rings per minute, they wanted at least 20 rings per minute at the register. And I was ringing like 10 items per minute. So they basically I thought I was a terrible cashier, even if I had like a good heart and good intention to learn how to be better. <laughs> I just wasn't getting it. And um, I finally I found a different job. I gave in my two weeks resignation and they were begging me to stay. Mm. I was like, I thought I'm so bad at this job. You know, you guys complain about all these little things. And, and I, th I just thought I'm not cut out to be a cashier. <laughs> and they were like, but you show up on time. All right. That's mm. the important thing. You show up on time your coworkers who know all their codes and and um who who can scan faster than you they can't even show up to work or they show up late you know and then i i, I never even considered that that was even more important <laughs> something as simple as this than being able to do the job well the fact that you even show up because if you don't show up the job doesn't even get done right yeah. that's something i learned from working at a minimum wage job i wouldn't learn that in an office right? Because they don't clock you hourly. Um, yeah. but, but it's valuable. And I talk about this story um, when I go into, into, so like in that transition of going from minimum wage to office jobs, you know, you have to somehow articulate the experiences and the lessons you've had at the previous jobs. And instead of going like, well, I don't know, that was a dead end job that wasn't going to lead anywhere, you know, just doing random tasks that are menial, repetitive and boring. Instead of like saying that traditional story, I say, no, I learned that it's really important to show up on time. Right? Like I took something like that and, and I made it something even better that impressed employers in the interview. Right? So I think it, it's good to start there. For young people okay so you talked about finding your purpose and and i was listening to robert green uh in, in fact just yesterday he talked about in his book mastery one of the things that was was real kind of foundational for that was finding your purpose and and he talked about oftentimes we see and and kind of intrinsic intrinsically know what our purpose is at a very early age because it's things that we're interested in and so you talked about peeling back the layers well oftentimes as you're moving forward those things that you found interesting, the things that you, you're like, you're, maybe even your life's purpose, you knew early on, but because those got shoved down because you had to do X, Y, A, B, C, A, B, C, O, you know, and then finally, after you get that minimum wage job, you have enough to, like you said, pay the bills and, and, and you'll live. Then you have an opportunity to peel those layers back, to peel back where you were when you were young enough to actually see, see something that you found interest in. And then that oftentimes is what he was saying was, is your your life's purpose and then you try to 
critique and, and scale and, and move in such a way that puts you in a position where you can do that, you know, perhaps as, as, as a hobby to start with, and then as a profession to, to move into. So it's interesting, uh, you know, connecting those, those two things, uh, you know, like that. That was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like what you're saying about that, it, it reminds me, all right. Like after you get that first job that can pay your bills, set aside an emergencies fund so that you feel secure and have enough money. Like when someone disrespects you at work, or will push back on your values, your boundaries. You kind of like have that money set aside to say, F you, you know, I'm worth more than this. This doesn't pay very well, but I don't need to be here. I'm just gonna find someone else who will employ me and, you know, give me the respect that I'm looking for. I've had many jobs where I had to walk away in that manner. <laughs> but I don't sure. I don't say that in interviews that that's the reason why I left. I, I say another reason. Um, but like, yeah, because you have that six month to a year's worth set aside, if you're really good and frugal and you save your money, you can do that. Right. And then after you have that set aside, it is your job to take some of the money that you're saving instead of having lifestyle inflation to start using that toward your calling. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I have been helping people with their finances for 10 years. I was making no money for five years, not a single dollar. In fact, I was putting money in because I had to pay for, you know, supplies, you know, workbook materials and things like that. I was putting it pouring time. I was up till late at night. I was working weekends on trying to help people with their finances for free. And then like my first YouTube video on how to save money on low income, it went viral. That was year five. And then that's only when people discovered me and they were just like, oh, how is she so lucky? How is she so lucky that like she just does this one hit wonder this? How, how often do people make one video that just goes viral from the start? Right. Uh, and then I'm just like me lucky. I've been working for free for five years teaching people how to save on the low income. You know, like th this video went viral because it's good. <laughs> the advice works. That's because I've tried it myself. I've helped other people with it. I've written a book on it, you know. Um, so you have to, I think in pursuing that calling, it's mandatory that you're good with your money because otherwise you'll be pressured and pulled to go towards something else that doesn't inspire you. That doesn't bring you any passion whatsoever. And your dream will die. It will die because when you take on so much credit card debt, car loan, student loan debt, a mortgage, when you have all of those debt obligations, you feel trapped. Like you cannot escape and go after the things you actually want. Now, you you talked about going viral. You, you've also achieved the, the best selling author status and have a significant following on YouTube. How do you how do you balance your successful online presence with your corporate career as a, as a as a as your account manager? So what I did is I don't actually work 40 hours a week at my quote unquote full-time job. I was hired for 40 hours a week, five years ago, right? Um, uh, but at that time, I, I, I learned how to do the job. It was be becoming like repetitive. I learned how to do it faster. And then I found that consistently I had, let's say like at 4 p.m. every day, I had like free time. I was like just sitting there looking for work to do, couldn't find anything. So I just told my boss, you know, uh, let me, take some courses. We were using this software called Appfolio for property management. And so I just started reading all of their support documentation. I was like, well, let's read the support documentation and see if there are some features in the software we're not taking advantage of that can help run things faster in, in the company, right? So I spent an hour a day taking those courses and watching videos, webinars, stuff like that. And then I, I made a whole list of things that could help speed things up at the company. I implemented those. And then I found that I finished my workday at three. Slowly, 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 I was like, well, I'm done with my work at two, at one, you know? And I kind of just had to say, it's kind of like embarrassing because like, it's a good thing to finish your work so quickly, but then I'm sitting there doing nothing. And then I'm wondering like, are my coworkers looking at me like, oh, Annie's slacking off, right? Uh, so I kind of like felt uncomfortable. So I asked to work hybrid um, two days, two days remote, three days in the office. And then a year after that, I was like, because when, when I was remote, I was hardly doing any work at home because most of the work was done in just three days instead of five. Uh, so finally I just said, can I work fully remote? And he said, yes, he understands. I work only maybe 10 to 15 hours a week at this point, but it's okay because the results, the output, the tasks that I've been given from when I was first hired, I'm still doing those same tasks. I just shortened it from 40 to just 15 a week. Uh, so I balance it by using the other 
what was it, 25, 25 hours for the other stuff, the stuff that you see me doing online. Okay, so that that's kind of interesting. I, I only hope that that we can, as a society, pick up on those things and and use and implement those things for for the vast majority of of, of, of workers wherever they're at. But the the interesting thing for that for me is is so that comes down to productivity. You you, you seemingly have increased productivity, you know, astronomically. If you could distill that down to one or two things. What are the one or two things that really help to propel that productivity so high? I, I think it's just one thing. It's oh, okay. Um, okay, fine. Maybe two if you really wanted to push me. <laughs> All right. The first thing is in uh, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He mm -hmm. talks about sharpening your saw, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you give two people the task of chopping down the tree with an axe. First guy starts chopping, chopping, chopping. He cannot chop it. Uh, in two hours, right? The other guy's just sharpening his saw in, and for two hours straight, and then he does one fell swoop and then it chopped, you know? Uh, so I, I think of that, you know, like I'm continually learning. Um, like I was saying, I was spending one hour per day learning the Appfolio software. What What is it? Because I find that companies, all companies do this. They buy a software, they don't get the full use out of it. They don't really know the whole thing, like what is it capable of? And then use it to its fullest. Instead, they buy several different softwares. They buy one software that has a time clock, another software that can track someone's screen, another software that has a to-do list. But like, they don't realize maybe the time clock software could already record someone's screen. Like, you know, they never knew that because they, they bought it for this, just that one feature, right? So we, first of all, get full use out of everything. Learning, you have to actually learn, like spend one hour a day learning. Like even before I was working that job, the reason why I think I got ahead so quickly is because I was spending one hour per day on udemy.com. I was buying $12.99 courses, like how to use like advanced Excel formulas, um, how to uh, get your email inbox down to zero, right? Or like how to maximize the full use out of Google Workspace, something that I'm sure a, a lot of companies use, right? Google Workspace, but we only use the, the uh, email portion of it and the calendar portion of it and nothing else right um so things like that that i think if you really understood how to use it you would speed up your productivity but the second thing is like well annie where do you get the the time the time in your day to even have one hour to educate yourself and my response to that is like how do you not have time i mean like what do you do after you finish your work day are you just like watching videos for two hours straight doing nothing you know like it's we all have the same hours you know i've met people who are far more productive than me how do they do it you know ruth ruth bader ginsburg right you you hear her story and she was going to harvard law school meanwhile she had a kid a baby that she had to take care of and her husband had cancer so she had to take care of him while in harvard law school along with that she had to go to his classes and take his notes for him so that he could be in bed and then um, he would dictate to her the uh, the essay, right? And she would be the one typing it up. So she did her work and she did his work and she took care of a baby. Like, how can she be productive, right? It, it, that's before computers were out as well. So I think we we have so many hours in a day, you just don't use it efficiently. You have to plan it out properly. I think you're capable of so much more. So, okay, M many, many millennials are, are facing tons of financial challenges, you know, uh, unemployment, student loan debt, uh, uh, loads of other things. How can, how can they negotiate their worth effectively and secure a salary increase and, and use that to their advantage? You have to know the market price for the job that you're doing. I think a millennial, when they try to negotiate, well, I've been at this job for five years, I need a raise. Or like, I've taken on more duties, therefore I need a raise. Or um, inflation is, has gotten so much worse, I can't afford to get ahead, I need a raise for cost of living adjustment. Like they, they come up with all of these reasons for like why they deserve more money that just isn't aligned with supply and demand. This is a capitalist society. You know, just, just like you go into a seafood restaurant, sometimes on the menu you want to get lobster, you want to get a whole... Um, Bronzino fish, it doesn't tell you the price, it says market price. 
<laughs> you know, and then you have to ask the the server, well, how much is it for today? What's the price today? Right? Mm -hmm. Same thing when it's for a job. There's no set price. It's the price for today. So you have to do that research, which I recommend. You just type in um, type in the the title. Either if you're looking for the job or you already have the job, right? Type in the title into Google. Uh, let's say it's a hotel manager, and then you type um, hotel manager salary Boston. It has to be related to your geographic area, right? And then all of these sites pull up like payscale.com, salary.com, glassdoor.com, indeed.com that, that give you like insight into salary. Open all of them. There should be about maybe 10 sources, maybe it's 20 sources. Open all of them and then open an Excel sheet and start typing in column A where you got this information from. Column B, you put the low that the, the site is giving you. Column C, you put the median. And column D, you put the high. So after all of this, you should have a whole set of lows, a whole set of medians, a whole set of highs, right? Because you cannot just trust one source. At, you know, when I, I was first doing this, I was like, I mean, the range is so high across these sources. It doesn't really make sense. You can't really pinpoint it. So what I did was I did an average of the low, an average of the medians, and an average of the highs. So that way, actually, I'm like, OK, I, can, I think I can trust these numbers. And then you have to figure out where you fit in along this scale. Like, did you just start? Do you not really know what you're doing? Then you kind of fit in the mid, uh, in the low, right? If you kind of have experience, you're in the middle. And if you're really good at what you do and you're in high demand, you're in the high end of this range, right? So this is the range you have to figure out where you fit and you come armed with data for your salary negotiation it's really hard to fight back when you have actual numbers you know i think that's the way to negotiate this the salary range as well is also also the explanation for why an individual contributor can make more than their manager because if you're at the high end of your pay range as an individual contributor and the manager has just started as a manager they're in the low end of their pay range so it's at that at that interception that causes you to earn more money than the manager but you're you've reached your limit you cannot make more money after you've hit that cap right because of that market price so actually the manager has potential to make more than you they've just simply make less right now but the the potential is far greater for the manager. Right. So, so doing research and then coming to your to your employer with, hey, this is these are the the market averages right now in this area. I think I fit into this area. What do you say about that? What? Yeah, that's a, you're right. It would be very difficult as the as the owner, the boss, whatever, the manager to negotiate that you know in any reasonable term for the business without taking those those facts and figures in, into into place. So yeah, what a what a useful tip for that. Now That's, your book that, Yeah. I, I just wanted to add that that is also what the managers do. <laughs> HR mm. does that as well. Where do they get their numbers? They do the same thing. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Now your book covers uh, management secrets for for full time employees building uh, side businesses. Now can you can you perhaps share some practical tips on on managing time efficiently and effectively trying to balance a full time with with the entrepreneurial kind of, of of pursuits and you talked about that a little bit but what what can millennials do to implement that so they can start to to work that for their own selves oh my gosh i i think people my husband tells me this right my husband is more of an employee mindset he he says well people should be able to to just work a nine to five be able to pay their bills and and build their wealth but should i mean it's never been the case right the people who get ahead financially they're they are the one percent it's always been the case that like the rockefellers the andrew carnegie's that we've heard about even back then they were the outliers they were not the norm the ones that became wealthy, you know, they didn't have just a job. They worked for themselves. Now, some of these people, they started working for them, uh, like they were working a job while building something on the side as well. So I think that's important to realize that, no, you're not entitled to just get ahead financially on just a nine to five job. I, I like to think of this mindset. The problem is not that people are not capable. It's this mindset shift that they need. From nine to five, I work to pay my bills. And then from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m., I work to build my fortune. So what hours between 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. you work to build your fortune, that's up to you. 
but you have to think of it in that way. Nine to five is just to pay the bills. Five to nine is to build your fortune. And well, don't kill yourself while doing it because I've suffered health health problems from pushing myself too far. But like, you have to do something. It's this mindset shift. Don't don't be entitled. You know, I think it's a time management thing as well. But first of all, it's this mindset shift about like being entitled. I think. Yeah, and and I you know I think you're right. Putting that into perspective like that really is key because that will give them an opportunity to to have better perspective on okay, this time is set aside just so I can pay the bills. And then, you know, all this time that I didn't think I have, I actually have this many hours to do for myself. And what am I doing in that time that's actually for me, that's benefiting me, moving towards my goals or, or whatever it is. So what a, yeah, what a good, good tool for that. Very good. Um, now, we talked a little bit about debt-free education and, and student loans are, are, are not super great. Fully agree with that. Could you offer maybe some guidance for our listeners that, would maybe be an, an alternate path uh, for education, skill development that didn't involve going to a university and, and having all the, the debt that's associated with that. Yeah, here's one that will actually work. You go on LinkedIn, you get the 30 day premium trial. So you don't have to pay anything for 30 days. You can cancel before that. Um, and then you start searching for the title that you want. This is especially for young people that are just starting out in their career. Someone told me he's working as a front desk agent at a hotel. So that's a job that doesn't even require a degree. I asked him, where do you want to go? Um, what do you want to be? He's like, well, I want to be a hotel manager. And then I was like, OK, let's figure out what it takes to get there. So what you do is you search on LinkedIn with the filter uh, people with the current job title, hotel manager. And then you just start looking at their profiles. What promotions did they have to take along the way to get there? And then for the education part, where did they get their degree from? What schools, what majors um, did they need to have? And that will be a huge eye opener for you because he was telling me, well, you can't be a hotel manager without a bachelor's degree in hospitality, you know, or something like that, something related to that. And then I was like, really? Is that really the case that every single hotel manager out there in the field has a bachelor's degree in hospitality. And that wasn't the case. I saw people who had degrees in geology, people who had degrees in marketing, biology, who became hotel managers. It was it was crazy, you know. Um, so that wish list that you see when they're asking for a whole list of qualifications, that's just a wish list. The people who actually end up getting hired for these jobs, when you see on LinkedIn with your research in real life, they don't necessarily meet that. So get it through your head first that it's not necessarily the case you even need that degree, right? Because I also saw people who had no degrees who were hotel managers when I did my research, no degree listed on their profile. Well, here's the thing, did they intentionally leave it out, right? Or did they like genuinely just didn't have the degree? That's the question. Well, you can also add them as a connection using the LinkedIn premium and add a message. Hey, I saw on your profile that you don't have a degree, but you became a hotel manager. I'm looking to do the same. Can I hear your story? I'm not trying to like get a job from you, but I, I'm genuinely curious how you did it. And that will put you in the right direction on like a debt free way to get what you want. Another thing I noticed was so many people who were a hotel manager who did not have a college degree, they got a certificate in hotel management from E Cornell. And I looked up the E Cornell certificate. It was like a $3,000 certificate course or something like that. I mean, $3,000, I think that's really affordable compared to what other people were paying, 40,000, 50,000. So that's also a viable option. So basically, what you're, to distill that down even further, you're looking for people that are kind of the exceptions in the in the field that that somebody wants to go into. Okay, these are the there's the wish list, but this person doesn't fit in that to that wish list. Find them, seek them out, and then ask them, hey, what did you do? And then in, in that term, you're you're getting sort of coaching advice from that person who's in the area that's doing the things you wanted to do. Took the path, hopefully that you can follow to do because they're already doing it, right? So that's a that. Again, yes, and and I'm sure that's a, another mindset shift for these people because they see those lists of, of that wish list, like you said, the, the qualifications. Well, I, I don't I don't fit that, so they they disqualify themselves from even applying for that job because they ah that's not for me. But lo and behold, people do it, and they're doing it already. Why can't they do it? 
precisely yeah. precisely and but the thing is like in terms of finding out the education the debt-free education part I mean, just from that quick search, a one hour research, right? You can see, oh, there were people without the degree. And then there were people who just got the e Cornell certificate for $3,000 who managed to become a hotel manager. So it's like, well, you could choose to reach out to them to find out more, but just that, that one hour research, you've already found out, oh, I just need this, this certificate, right? Mm -hmm. That's a debt free education right there. Mm -hmm. And seemingly what that tells us is it's less about the qualifications people have, less about how they how they appear on paper, but maybe more about who they are as a person, how they interact. And, and that, I'm sure this is more than just for hotel managers, but across the board, um, it's less of, of what check uh, what what boxes they check on a page, and more about what they're capable of in person doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing. Would you agree with that? I agree with that because like what I'm teaching you right now about like how to figure out a debt free education, that's a problem solving skill. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's you asking me, there's this problem. How do you solve it? And I'm teaching you how you solve this problem. Like if you take this same mindset, this critical thinking and then this process of like, how do I solve this problem? How do I do the research to figure out what the solution is? I mean, if you're able to do that in any situation, then that's a, a trait that people want, not just like for employers wanting it in an employee. That's a trait that clients want in in their service providers as well. All the way across the board. Absolutely. So f moving moving to to financial literacy, uh, of course, that's a that's a, a crucial crucial thing for for long term success. And and you know what are some some fundamentals uh, as far as financial concepts go for uh, young professionals to understand and and how they should start their financial education journey. The first thing I think people need to do is to be fully aware of where they are financially because. Uh, this is so basic, but I have helped people and it turns out that they don't even know how much debt they owe. I'm like, uh, what is your student loan balance? I don't know. Do you not get statements every month? I do, but I didn't look at it. Okay, so the first thing is you have to be aware of where you are. You know, Take a look at all your bank statements, credit card statements, and other personal loan statements. Um, add up the totals and then add up like like write down in a spreadsheet what the minimum payment is and then with this you can make a budget right you start with the budget how much you bring in after tax and then even if like you you miss you have to miss your payments i still want people to set aside 10 percent of their income to build up like a quick maybe a one thousand dollar emergency fund because that one thousand dollars is important like what if something happens and you need a car repair done that's at least less than a thousand, then you're not charging it to your credit card. You can just pull it from your emergency fund and rebuild that, right? So that's really important. Just a really small cushion, maybe two thousand in today's age, right? Um, and then you work hard at paying off your student loan debts and, and other debts. Like you add up, you can, there's two methods, right? One is more motivating than the other. The first one is the snowball method where you pay off the one that has the lowest balance. Like, let's say you have one credit card that's 800, right? You make minimum payments on everything except for that one credit card. And then you, you throw all your money at it that you can. That's why the side hustle is important or getting a sec second part-time job. In addition to your full-time, you pay it off quickly. And then um, you take that money that you're putting toward that $800 credit card bill and pay off the second debt, right? And then it just snowballs from there because each payment gets bigger and bigger with the next debt that you pay off. You can follow the same method with like focusing on one, but instead you sort the order from like highest interest rate to lowest interest rate. But the problem with the highest interest rate to lowest interest rate is like you're probably chipping away at the highest balance as well. And it, you might not be motivated, you know. So from a number standpoint, the second method where you pay off the highest interest rates first makes more sense and you would save more money in the long term. But I feel like the problem is people emotionally have a hard time with money. <laughs> so they might feel a lot more motivated toward going after their goals of paying it all off by following the first one. Very good. And yeah, I'm sure that as they see those numbers start to dwindle down, that you're talking about the emotional benefit to that, you see the numbers start to lower and lower and lower, that's gonna uh, incentivize them to, okay, let's, let's just get this all the way done. And then once that's done, then they move on to the next one. That that type of, of momentum, the, the snowball effect, uh, very clearly, it, it, I think would be beneficial as opposed to chipping away at, 
you know, oh man, this number's barely changed. I'm putting all this, but it's not doing, but doing it the other way. I think, uh, you know, way maybe isn't as financially, you know, percentage wise the best. It will probably yield better results because of the momentum that is gained as you go. That's right. Now, um, one of one of the big things that I think people struggle with as far as going throughout and 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 finding new jobs is once they get to get an opportunity opportunity to go and interview with somebody. Interviews seem to be really difficult for for people, especially you know Gen Z and, and millennials have a tough time. I think for that, what are what are some some tips perhaps you can say for them to to help to ace a job interview? The interview is like a final exam for the college semester right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i i don't put a lot of focus on the interview i put a lot of focus on everything leading up to the interview because once the interview is there it's like there's not much you can do you just show up as yourself if you are an amazing person you will do amazing in the interview right but like brushing up on the skill of interviewing is something you actually do way ahead of the interview it's not something you do in the week of the interview where you practice, uh, you know, scripted answers, because you can never predict what people are going to ask you. Just like you're asking me questions right now, I have to speak off the cuff. <laughs> um, so the way to get really good at it is something that I got from Warren Buffett. He said the number one skill that you can invest in yourself that will give you um, the biggest boost in your income is public speaking. So when I, I read that in an article, I was like, oh, OK, I have to learn public speaking. Well, how do I learn that? And of course, I'm scared out of my mind because, you know, I'm really shy. Um, I had to look for a local Toastmasters club at the time. I don't know how much the membership dues are today, but they're not e they were not even $100 back then. I think they were like $45 for, for the year or something like that. So it's like not even a gym membership cost, okay? Um, yeah. So get a Toastmasters membership and then just follow their structure, right? Like do your first 10 speeches. I have seen people do 10 speeches over the course of a year. Who they came in as versus who they are after giving 10 speeches is like night and day. These are people with severe social anxiety that have like actually been diagnosed by a psychologist with social anxiety, but they're able to get up on stage and um, their presence is a lot better and they're able to speak off the cuff as well. Okay, so I, I've heard about Toastmasters before. I'm kind of interested as far as, I, I see the benefit from that. I understand how that would work, but in, in practice, do you think it's, it, it is beneficial, so beneficial for those individuals, especially like you said, they, they come in, they're, they're really, really tough, hard to, hard to talk up on stage like that in front of anybody, let alone a, you know, a group of people. Do you think the benefit is doing those 10? Do you think the benefit is is facing the fear and doing it anyways? Do you think it is it is because the people that are there listening are going to be there listening and, and give them support, even though, you know, maybe they don't do the best? You know, I'm just as far as what helps to propel them to achieve those things, to be better at that. What, what do you what do you think it is that, that does that? The benefit is the actual com learning how to communicate. So what we do in Toastmasters is we cannot tell you what your content should be. Your stories, the things that you choose to talk about, that's all on you. That's the same with your interview as well. I cannot tell you what you can say or cannot say in your interview, right? But what we can do is like we can package you up so that you're more attractive, right? Like because 10, only 10% 10 of communication is the actual words that you say. The other 90% is your body language, your eye contact, um, your tone of voice that communicates much more than what you say, because I can say, I love you versus, yeah, I love you. You know, like one, one is saying like, I love you with contempt. And then the other is like the sweet, I I'm so in love with you kind of thing. Right. The, those are two different messages with the same words. Right. Um, so what you learn to do is really master the control of the body language and the tone of voice um how to walk how to use your hand gestures and things like that so the curriculum is different today they've updated the curriculum to have like more pathways where you can choose what you want to do um, as a project but it used to be that when i went there the first one was just an icebreaker so like getting over the fear of like just getting up on the stage the second one was how to organize your speech so like everything needs a beginning, middle and an end, right? Well, same with an interview answer as well, right? Uh, the third thing I think was your body language. 
getting used to walking around on stage. Fourth thing was like vocal variety. So like using different aspects of your voice, going from high to low, you know, like using all of these and then using that to communicate. Um, there's just so many aspects of this that they've broken down into like this one piece that like you work on and focus on that you get better after 10. Very good. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, I have heard, like I said, I've heard of Toastmasters before. I read a, a couple of people that have went through that program. I guess I, I didn't, I don't know why, but until now, until you were talking about this, I didn't realize that there's, of course, you go and do the speeches, but then there's a curriculum where you're actually learning and developing and working on, on improving that is more than just get up on stage and do it. I think probably get up on stage is where the practice is. That's where the, the practical application comes into play. But of course, there's there's learning how to do it and then go and test it. Okay, this worked, this didn't work. And then you get feedback on you know how you did. And I'm sure that's the 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 roadmap for for improvement from there. But again, I, I for whatever reason, I, I had not thought about that. Okay, it's more than just getting up on stage. There's, of course, learning that's happening so that when you get up on stage, you can improve and be better next time as opposed to on accident, on, on purpose. That's right. Yeah. And the, the feedback is actually the most important thing. Hmm. You do not get better unless you implement the feedback that people give you. So after you give a speech, what people do is they take notes on what you did well to, to make you to encourage you to keep doing more. But they also tell you what could have been improved. They don't say what you did bad. They, they say how how you can improve it. Right. So it's not just enough to say, oh, you stood ugly. The way you stand is ugly. What? That doesn't help me. You know, that's <laughs> That's criticism, but it's not constructive, right? My dad gave that feedback one time when he saw me give a speech. Oh, you don't stand like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton <laughs> stands more elegant than you, but that's not helpful, you know? Um, so other people at Toastmasters would say like, why don't you stand with your feet a bit closer together? And then like, don't bend your knees so much, stand a bit more straight, right? That's something I can actually implement that I can use to get better. Right. So uh, they always give feedback. They they have you like take notes on um, someone's speech. And then at the end, they put it all in a basket for you. Mm. OK. And so I, 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 I think about this and kind of in terms of, of what a, a stand up comedian does. Stand up comedian is, is of course, that, that includes public speaking. That includes listener feedback on on the media, on, on the fly, because you, as you're as you're up standing up there telling the joke, you tell a joke, you think it's hilarious and and crickets nothing okay yep take that one let's get that out of the out of the set let's move on and do the next one and so i'm I, into in some regard i'm sure that giving a speech in front of a, a a crowd of people is like that but it's very much more minute in the responses from the individuals because you know, i've heard of uh, jordan peterson talks about this when he's up on stage and he's talking and it's silent out there then he knows that whatever he's saying is on point and it's important to them. But if he's up there giving a speech and people are moving, they're rustling, they're, then okay, maybe it, maybe it, it isn't hitting home as much as it, as it could because they're not necessarily you know, all in listening to it. So the feedback that a comedian gets versus a public speaker is similar, but it's so much more minute when you're a public speaker because they're not outwardly laughing and telling you, hey, that was awesome. They're either they're sitting and doing nothing no movement, no nothing, no silence, or they're moving around a little bit. And that moving around a little bit is your cue that, oh, okay, maybe that wasn't as good as it, as it could have been. I need to adjust, improve, and make some uh, you know, adjustments to that. That's interesting. Now, yeah. Have, have you heard of that before? <laughs> I have never heard of that before because I was so used to like speaking at Toastmasters where people would you know, give verbal cues like they're liking this, they're nodding and things like that. That like when I actually go to speak in person at other places outside of Toastmasters and people are silent, I'm like, did that land well? <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> so so with that with that kind of in mind, does that does that make sense? Like if they're if you're talking into a crowd of people and they're they're silent, it's probably again, I'm, I'm going off of what Jordan Peterson says, um, that means that that's landing. But if they're adjusting, they're moving and that you know, means it probably didn't hit as well. I, I I don't have a ton of experience with that. Seemingly you do. Does that, does that. Does now that it makes does sense. That... Now yeah, it makes okay. sense because they come up afterward and they say, I really liked what you said, but then I'm just like, are they being genuine or they just want to like superficially compliment me? Right. So sure, sure. now it makes sense why it's so silent. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, and your, your story is incredibly motivating the way you, you progressed up the ladder 
Now, as we wrap up, uh, could you share a piece of advice or mantra that has, has personally guided you on your journey to help inspire the listeners? Yeah, the biggest mantra, I always leave people with this at the end when they ask me, is to go big or go home. Don't live a small life, you know? Um, especially if this is, since this is about job search, apply to 50 jobs a day. Don't stop until you get a job offer. I don't care how many people ignore you, say no, ghost you. You keep applying until you get one, right? Like if it takes you 299 no's before you finally get one yes, one person who's like, you know what, Annie, I'm gonna take a chance on you. I'll give you this job. You can prove yourself and let's see how far you can go. Um, that's all I need. That's all I need, right? I go big or go home in everything I do. Like when I said I'm gonna get on podcasts, I'm not just gonna get on 10, I'm gonna get on 500. Right. When I apply for a book awards, award winning author here. Right. Did I apply for just five? No, I applied to 50. I was like, let me apply to 50 and see how many um, give me like an award. Right. So I, I go big or go home in everything I do. I think that's the secret sauce. Very good. And, and you know, where can our listeners go to to look, find out more about you? The best way is by going to www.annieyangfinancial.com. That's A-N-N-I-E-Y-A-N-G financial.com. The five-day audio, uh, five-day job search audiobook is free. So you can also just download it on my website. At the top, you click on the audiobook link and then just put in your name, your email address, and you can download it. It's five hours long. And then um, right now I have a following on YouTube but I'm going to be moving over to TikTok for 2024 because the algorithm is much better. It's almost impossible to grow on YouTube these days, right? So I really appreciate it if people could follow me on TikTok. It's uh, username handle is Annie Yang Financial. Very good. And I'll be sure to, to link those in the, in the show notes as well. Well, Annie, thank you for, for sharing your insights, your expertise with us today. Your, your practical advice and, and actionable strategies are invaluable for our listeners aiming to enhance their, their financial well-being and their career. Uh, you know, listeners, listeners, thank you for, for tuning into this episode of the Procedures Initiative. Stay tuned for more empowering conversations. Until next time, remember, your potential is limitless.